Welcome back and hello if you are new. Thank you so much for tuning in. Previously the band began to create a compromise between both classical and death metal and created a fantastic assimilation of both that was King. But the question is, can they recreate this genius combination on their fifth brand new album, Veleno? So with their previous album being King, it was a concept album that had a particular story and was, had a narrative, essentially. This time round, Veleno, which is Italian for Venom, does definitely follow an overarching kind of theme, but it's more in the music, if anything, than an actual concept of the album. And potentially the biggest change on this album is a lineup change in the fact that Tommaso Riccardi is no longer in the band, as well as Cristiano Triumfera. I think I've pronounced them roughly, okay. <laughs> Which has then meant that drummer Francesco Paoli has had to kind of jump in on guitar and vocals, but don't worry, it's still the same fantastic Flesh God Apocalypse formula. So the record opens with Fury, which immediately positions us into more of a death metal sound, which I was really, really interested in, but then the song does kind of lose its way a little bit where the rhythm kind of passages do become a little bit nondescript and kind of hard to follow, really. Thankfully, this is then sort of rescued by Carnivorous Lamb, which is the next track. And here is where the idea of melody really begins to come to the fore. However, of course, this sense of urgency that Flesh God have always prided themselves on is definitely still apparent on Sugar. Sugar itself is a perfect example of how Flesh God Apocalypse might have adapted the level of technicality that we would have seen on, say, Oracles, for example, but put it together with the songwriting ability of King to create a composite of the two. And there's a fantastic swelling chorus that really kind of, you know, breathes that sense of life into the song. And easily one of my favourite guitar solos on the record, which is incredibly technical, but not technical for the sake of being technical, if you know what I mean. Veleno does, however, have a great sense of pace about it, and following the pretty abrasive sugar, we're then moved into the Praying Mantis strategy, which is only a small minute interlude, but it sets up perfectly for Mona Lisa, which follows the breadcrumbs that were left from the Praying Mantis strategy. But what I liked the most about Mona Lisa is that the fact that the song is very mid-tempo, and the verse itself is led purely by bass, some kind of fluttering piano in there, and then they've also got these staccato style violin strings which are actually accompanying everything. It's also where for the first time the vocals sound very Karak Angren-esque and have this real level of theatricality about them. Though Veleno's melody is definitely its saving grace, and used as kind of like a twine in a labyrinth for example, small reference to one of their albums there, <laughs> Although there may be kind of a bit nondescript riffing kind of going on, it's always brought back with this overarching melody which comes in, particularly in Sugar. King fans will also feel right at home with Pissing on the Score, which essentially starts off with this ivory tinkling piano section, but then midway through we moved into this really interesting, almost like decapitated, diminished section, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I think that the lead sections have definitely stepped up a notch on the album, and there are small arpeggios, for example, in Absinthe, and as I mentioned before, on Pissing on the Score, it's this, this guitar lead that comes in and just cuts everything in half, and you need that, you need that difference. However, for me, it's Worship and Forget where the album does fall down a, a little because it does feel like this is nondescript. There's not really much that you remember from this track overall. There are sections where the tremolo riffing can kind of blur into one, and particularly with it being six minutes long, it's just a bit forgettable. However, later in the album, The Day We'll Be Gone again brings this pace back 
and has kind of a, a ballad, which is, you know, kind of this duet with the beautiful female operatic vocals. But I think it's kind of reserving itself for the grand finale that is Embrace the Oblivion. And although this song is incredibly bombastic and very cinematic, for me, the jewel in the crown of Valeno is the title track right at the end of this, which almost acts as like a closing of the credits. You know when you're the last person in the cinema and you see those credits come up and that film is just finally finished. And that's how it felt when I listened to this record every time it was a logical conclusion and it made you want to kind of dive back into it. Perhaps if the album had been shorter, there might have been more of a tighter Flesh God Apocalypse formula that would kind of bring it to that fantastic level album. But as it goes, this is a great album and it showcases that Flesh God Apocalypse are carrying on this idea that they put forward in King. The important thing is though, is that they don't begin to kind of replicate this sound on King. It was okay on Veleno because it's fairly well structured and there are some sections where it does wobble a bit, but on their next outing, they're gonna have to be even more experimental. And that's what I loved, I think the most about Veleno was the bits that I didn't expect. So for that reason, I'm gonna give this record a four out of five. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments and be sure to check out all my album reviews, interviews, all that good stuff. And I will see you guys next week for another album review. All right, take care friends.